Hello, one place. I'm so glad you're all here to worship the Lord with me and with each other. Be thankful for things. Um, pray together. Uh, I was talking, texting actually, to uh, Japheth this morning. And uh, he's not here, not only because he's leaving, but because he's sick. So keep him in your prayers right now, too. When I was asked to preach, they gave me a, uh, three chapters to choose from. And uh, I said, oh, what's, you know, they usually give a couple chapters. So I said, well, that gives me a big, big choice. Uh, fortunately, they asked me months ago, months ago so I could plan on, on things well ahead of time, especially with Thanksgiving and with remodeling so we had another bathroom for all of our family that's come in this time of year so we didn't have to crowd into less facilities. Um, but I'm glad I had that time because the texts that they gave me were uh, kind of challenging. Uh, how many of you, when you read a book, you kind of like to look at the back and read the end first? Not too many of you like that, some of you. Um, so I had three chapters. So I started at the, the yeah, so where is this leading to? I like to get into that. And I said, uh-oh. Um, let's see. This starts here. Oh, my. Uh, it's all genealogy. You like to hear sermons about, you know, genealogy? Or is that, or is that the part you go to, to, well, let's see, where does that end? So I can start really reading again. Uh, so, okay, I'll back up a little bit. I'll go to the beginning. Now, I'm going to use some words today that uh, I wouldn't normally use, but uh, they're not in the Bible, because the Bible doesn't mix, mince words. But I, I was told by my oldest daughter, um, your grandkids are going to be in here, and they love to repeat words, especially really weird words like are used here, and in inappropriate places like school. So if they hear about some of these things in the, that language, they will definitely pick up on them. And, and Grandpa said it, so it must be all right. Uh, and, and by the way, for anybody who's thinking this is a couple days after Thanksgiving, it's too soon for Santa Claus. Um, I, I've been accused of being that before. Ho, ho, ho. Uh, but uh, no, we're not, just start, we're not starting that season too early. Um, so I will be using other words. If you want the original words, the, the tougher words, uh, go to the text. It's uh, chapters uh, 34, 35, and 36 of Genesis. This wasn't an easy place either because it starts with a little girl getting into trouble of uh, what we would often consider some of the worst kind. She decided she would have some friends, local friends. Now you see, Jacob had moved his family to a place far away from home. Still in, in Israel, but you know, still in the promised land, but on the opposite end. Because Jacob, although he had begun to learn the lesson of not being Jacob, but becoming Israel, it didn't happen instantly. He, he knew it in his heart, and he desired it. But change doesn't come easy. How, how many, change come easy for you? Especially if you got some, you know, really ingrained habits of a lifetime already. What does Jacob mean, by the way? Deceiver, yeah, heel grabber, tripper, deceiver. He had been all his life, from the time he was being born, the heel grabber. He deceived his father, the thinking he was the one that should get the blessing. Well, he really was. He just had gotten it from Esau, but the father wasn't going to give it to him. So he, he used deception, craftiness to try to get it. And then he realized, oops, this has consequences. My brother is saying he's going to kill me. He has to run. He runs from... One place that is 
pretty hot to a furnace that is hotter. He's got an uncle up there that is a better deceiver than he is. He tricks him, gives him the wrong wife. He tricks him and changes his wages a number of times after he's got his wives. And he's always being deceived. Now, Jacob's good, pretty good at fencing back and forth with these deceptions. And finally, he says, I'm, I know he's going to do something really tricky if I tell him I want to leave. So one night, we're just going to pick up stakes and we're going to go, which really makes his father-in-law angry, especially since Jacob has been all the time promising that what he does is a blessing of God. And now, he must not really trust in his God because he's taken all the idols. So he must have trusted in those too. He gets there, he can't find them. Why? Because his daughter, Rachel, is taking after her father And she's deceiving him. She says, I'm, uh, I, I, I'm sitting on this here because I, I really can't get up, Dad. I, I'm in the way of women. Um, and, and you wouldn't want me to get up. Even though the custom is, even in that case, you, you're supposed to get up when a parent enters the room. It was the custom of that day. But he lets his little daughter get by with it. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. Probably because he recognized there was some uncleanness if he was to go and, and touch where she was sitting. But... Uh, at any rate, she hides the idols. And what happens to those idols? They stay around for years, even after they're discovered. So there's idolatry still in Jacob's family, even after they go into the, the promised land. And Jacob, when he sees Esau, we're backing up here before the chapters get a little background. When he sees Esau, and Esau says, well, you know, we'll give you an escort. I'll, I'll leave some guys with you. That, you know. He says, no, they're going to want to move too fast. We move slow. Go on, we'll be okay. We'll, we'll catch up to you and we'll, we'll meet, meet you at dads. And immediately they take off in the other direction. Not toward dads, toward Shechem. Now, I don't know, maybe, maybe Jacob went and visited personally, privately. But they don't get down to dads again for a number of years before they go actually as a group. The whole family goes down and sees, dad, sees uh, Grandpa Isaac. So what are they doing all this time? Well, they buy some land. They actually get land there. They buy it. And he builds a house. He's not in tents anymore. He's got pens and things for his, his sheep and, and, and corrals for cattle. And he's, he's really settling in. How many of you can think back to when you were a freshman, not in college, in high school. Okay, maybe you're, some of you aren't there yet, but you know, here is a young lady, freshman age, maybe even a little bit younger, 14, 15, in a day when puberty wasn't quite coming early. I mean, they didn't get married until they were at least around 30, between 30 and 40, typically. Uh, and here's this young lady, she's not, she's not escorted, which means that she hadn't reached puberty yet by the customs of that day. And she was out with her friends who were worldly people. They were having parties in the town of Shechem. And she gets invited up to the castle. And the prince really likes her a little too much. I told you I wouldn't go into all those words. And uh, word gets back to Dad that uh, she's now living with the prince. Now, whether she's there willingly or unwillingly, we don't know, but it says that he sweet-talked her. He knew just the right things to say that made her heart go, wow, I can be princess, I can be here, I, I, this is wonderful. Dad says, I will wait 
until my sons get back in from, from uh, the roundup. And we will talk about your request to, to, to marry Dinah. Inside, Jacob is fuming. Later, the, the, the proverb would be written, better is he to control his tongue or his anger than he who takes a city. What he didn't know is his sons were planning on taking the city. They used deception. I wonder who they learned that from. You see, when we teach people by the way we live, it goes on for generations and generations. Sometimes even when we have decided to stop doing it ourselves, although Jacob hadn't totally learned that, those lessons, but he was working on it. His heart was there. And his sons say, you know what? If you want to marry our sister, that's fine with us. <clears throat> but you've got to do something to, to be like, like our family. And it's going to hurt a bit. But it makes you like our family. And you, you, all you guys got to do it. And they said, ouch, but you know what? The king says, look how rich Jacob is. He's richer than us. And if we marry his daughters and his daughters marry our sons, we'll be really wealthy. It's a good deal. Come on, guys, it's only a little thing. So they all did it. And about three days later, when they were going through some consequences for having done it, the two full-blood brothers of Dinah, Simeon and Levi, who've engineered this whole course of deception, go in and get rid of all the, the men, take back their, daughter, their, their sister, and steal everything else, or, or even just destroy it. And now Jacob is thinking, not what does my God think of this? But what are the people going to think? What are the, uh, all the people around? They're, they're, they're going to be really upset with us. They're going to not trust us. We're like a stinking thing in their, their, their nose. It's, we, we can't be around here. They're, they're going to hate us. And just about then, God kind of taps him on the shoulder. Uh, hey, Turn your attention this way. Oh, Lord. Another manifestation of God to him. He says, I have a plan for you. Go down to Bethel. You know where we met originally when you were running away from your brother who wanted to kill you? When you made a covenant with me? Go back and renew that covenant. How many people here have ever been deceived by anything? By somebody that would lie to you at ever? Maybe a product that you bought. You know, it looked really good in the ads. And maybe even the packaging was nice, but you got it open and you went, this is good for junk. It's good. What is this garbage? I thought it was going to be wonderful. And, and look at, the, oh, oh, disappointment. And there's a no return policy. You nearly know that they were planning on deceiving you. Sometimes deception actually may not be so bad a thing. I sat in on a, uh, a lecture just by, by chance one time a number of years ago. Ron Dupree, maybe some of you know him, uh, he's here in Michigan Conference and uh, had been here at Andrew's teaching. But uh, at the time I met him, he was just finishing up his degree in ethics. And he was talking about this at the cafeteria. And since I had to eat, and I was there, I said, why don't I eat in the little room where they're talking about ethics? A fantastically challenging topic. All sorts of intricacies of what is right and what is wrong. You always know what's right and what's wrong. Sometimes there's gray areas, and you go, well, what is this, is that? How, how do I deal with it? 
That's what ethics is all about. Trying to sort out those gray areas in, in later times than, than Jacob was living. After God had already given them all the instructions that through Moses, people still weren't very clear on things. One of my most interesting repetitions in the scripture during that time of the judges is, and the people did what was right in their own eyes. We don't know what's right, but we'll figure it out and whatever feels good and whatever, you know, I grew up in the, the uh, 70s, uh, the love era, peace, love, uh, whatever feels right to you must be right. But that can be wrong. God is saying, I have a better plan for you. Go back. Back to where you began. Back to the relationship that you desired back then, that you still desire. Jacob thought about it and said, you know, that sounds like a great idea. It'll get us out of the town. We have to leave our stuff, just the, the property, take our cattle and everything, but leave, leave a lot of stuff and go. And uh, start all over again. New starts. Isn't that a good thing? You know, that God gives us the ability to start over again. And he says, well, there's one thing I don't think God's going to like. I know that Rachel has been hanging on to these things and that the, the kids have been playing with them and all that. It, we, we can't bring them, not to Bethel. It's those idols that were hiding in that camel's seat. What are we going to do with them? Well, there was a big oak tree there. Some say it was the same oak tree that Abraham first was by when he made the first altar as he entered the promised land. And by that oak tree, they dug a big hole and they threw in all those idols. They threw in everything else that might hold them back. They said earrings, jewelry, everything that was, might hold them back. Now, we, we don't look at things the same today, but we do have idols. We do have things that hold us back. We may have friends that hold us back, like Dinah had. And as we read in uh, Patriarchs and Prophets, it says, when we go someplace, we better be able to go with God. Because those influences will have long-lasting effect upon us, even if not immediate effect. I know when I was uh, first an Adventist, we used to do something called ingathering. We don't do it as much anymore, but I was told one thing that you do. When you go to houses, you never actually go inside the house because there might be bad people that will just you know, kidnap you and you disappear and everybody's looking around where you are. And you don't go into bars. Now, the bar thing was not such a, a bad idea some people found because they found that, that those drunks gave a lot of money. Uh, good for ingathering. But they also told us we are warned that when you go into places like that, your angels wait outside. So you don't want to go where, where your angels aren't going to come in with you. Now, I, I know uh, sometimes we get kind of um, wanting to run ahead of things. And sometimes God even blesses that. I must have some tough angels. I know I have a couple of them at least. Um, I know that there is reality and that there is things that look like they're real. And uh, I know I have seen and talked to my angels, which is weird. I know if it's fine in the Bible, it's, it's fine. You talk to somebody who's actually seen and talked to their angels, you go, woo. -hoo. But you know, I've had that experience. So I know I've got a couple of angels at least. Uh, and one day I walked into a bar. I walked into the bar because something was going on there that I thought would be of, of interest to me. I got to back up a little bit. When I was in first grade, six years old, just about to turn seven, we had a substitute teacher. My regular teacher, who I loved and I hated the 
that she was getting married, because I was you know, one of those little kids that wanted to marry their first grade teacher. Um, but uh, she got cancer, and uh, we had to have a substitute for a while. And he was a man. But he was okay, he was a cool guy. He uh, told us if we did all our work, and we were good every day, each day at the end of class, he would do something fantastic and amazing. He did magic tricks. And so from a little child, I was, wow. I wanted to be a magician. And I asked for my seventh birthday for, for magic kits and tricks. And, and as I grew up, I became a magician. I became a, an entertainer for birthday parties and for uh, school assemblies and a whole entertained at the military. Uh, uh, the guys were coming back from Vietnam, they were in the hospital, I was up there, they were doing programs for them. And when I became a Seventh-day Adventist, I went to a camp meeting and I started asking young people, because there were no young people in my church, uh, it was one of those old churches where the, where the 80-year-olds were young. Um, and I started asking them, you know, why should I be an Adventist? And strangely, they said, uh, oh, you don't know. <clears throat> There's no reason I should join the Seventh-day Adventist Church? No, not that we can think of. Well, then tell me why I should not be a Seventh-day Adventist. And they came up with all sorts of things. Uh, my, my favorite one was, um, in the time of trouble, if you're an Adventist, you're going to have to run. And I thought... Yeah, yeah, but don't you want to run with God's people rather than hang out with the, the devil's people? Oh, yeah, I suppose. And then among all the other things they said, uh, I asked them, what's the, what's the most difficult thing? What's the worst thing about being an Adventist? They said, the Sabbath. Huh, the Sabbath? I like the Sabbath. What's wrong with the Sabbath? Oh, it's boring. Well, what do you mean? There's nothing to do on Sabbath. I said, well, I, I'm not an Adventist yet, but I, I've been going out studying the Bible with, with people, with the people who've been studying with me, and, and you can, give, you can, you, can uh, you know, witness. And they said, uh, yeah, you could. But there are only so many tracks you can pass out, and then that gets boring. Huh? So what if I could make witnessing interesting, exciting, would you want to do it? Well, sure, but how are you going to do that? I said, I have no idea. Let me go pray about it. So I went off to the door room at the, at the uh, uh, academy there, where I was just staying for the camp meeting, and I prayed. And God, uh, I said, what, 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 how am I going to do this? And, uh, basically, the Lord said, what do you got in your hand? Like Moses, you know, you're a shepherd, okay, you got a rod, lead the people. Uh, what do you do? I'm a magician. Well, isn't that interesting? I guess. Go tell them, you'll show them how to lead people to Christ with this. So I told them, they said, okay, if you can do that, we, we, we want it. I said, okay, next year I'll be back, I'm going to work on it. I worked on it with Chicago street gangs. I figured, you know, if you can do it with a tough audience, you, you, you probably, it works. And I was having uh, members of, and leaders of Chicago street gangs uh, giving their hearts to Christ. Uh, and I said, uh, it must work. So I went back and I gave them some of the things I'd been learning. I had some people in my church help me uh, make up enough sets of things that they could do it. And uh, years later, when I was first uh, becoming a pastor in that uh, conference later, um, I had one of the fathers tell me some of the things that had happened to the, to the young people my, my age and younger that uh, I'd given these things to. He said his own son was about ready to leave the church, just didn't, didn't uh, make sense to him. And he said once he began to do that, now he's a youth pastor. And he said uh, his, his best buddy also ready, was ready to leave the church. Uh, and he's in seminary right now. And another girl he knew was, was also dissatisfied. And she's now a school teacher, teaching kids about Jesus. 
So I said, that, that must, must work. Uh, there are lots of other things to tell you about that, but don't have the time. Need to get into the text again. Uh, the boys have not learned this yet. He had not learned it yet, Jacob. But there at Bethel, God again speaks to him. Chapter 35, verse nine, beginning at verse 9, it says, Then God appeared to Jacob again when he came from Padan Aram and blessed him. And God said to him, Your name is Jacob. Your name shall not be called Jacob anymore. But Israel shall be your name. So he called his name Israel. And God said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply, a nation and a company of nations shall proceed from you, and kings shall come from your, your body. Now, there was not going to be a king in Israel until uh, Saul and David. That was still a long, long centuries off. But we come to the genealogies, and it talks about Esau's having kings in his family. Long before there was a king, in Israel that was only promised. Well, how did he know that? Well, how do you think, well, wait a minute. There's a lot of generations here. Who's writing this anyway? And then you go, oh, of course, Moses. So he knows what's going to happen all the way up to his time. And he can look back. So he's putting this in here so that you can see something else that has happened. Esau knows that Jacob is a deceiver. And he kind of passes that information down generation after generation. And when the children of Israel, and by the way, these, just these chapters are the first time that all of them are called Israel, not just Jacob. The Amalekites, who are kind of the left-wing weirdo um, uh, black sheep of Esau's family, they don't even get along with Esau's family, uh, decide that eh, they're not coming back into the territory, and they attack. And then finally, when that's all taken care of, God beats them back. Moses eventually asks, can we come through your territory? We'll take the road, we won't even take your water, we'll bring all the water we need with us, we won't touch your wells, We'll just go through it. You're the shortcut right to the land we're supposed to go to. And they say, mm, don't think so. You'll get all the way in. You're a big people, and you're, 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 you get right in there, right in the middle of us, and then you just, you'll take us over. We don't trust you. You're deceivers. That's the bad thing about deception. Now, sometimes there's good about deception, Okay. Um, how many of you have ever seen a, a movie in which somebody gets shot? In a movie, a television program? Aren't you glad that was a deception? You know, they have little squid things that look like they were shot. They weren't, you know, if you feel like the actor, you may want to see him in another, another program, you know. Uh, don't want him to get killed. Uh, it's good to have some things like that. It's, it's a theater. It's something that we're, we're used to seeing being deceived by, and we say it's okay. Um, long ago in uh, World War II, there was a magician in England who was really good at making things disappear and appear. And uh, they had him make the armies, the Allied forces, disappear. Well, he was very good at camouflage. And appear over here. He had little things that went poof, folded up and, you know, styrofoam and, and press board and whatever, and, and it looked like the whole army was there. And then he kind of camouflaged that just a little bit poorly, and they go, ah, we see where they are. They're hiding here. And they would bomb it, and then you go back and reconstruct it and put it someplace else, and they'd bomb over there. How'd they do that? How'd they do that? And then you wouldn't find the real army until they were ready to attack. But you see, you don't tell your strategies to the enemy ahead of time. Is that deception? Well, it's expected. But here, Jacob's sons, we're not dealing with an enemy. 
They were dealing with somebody who was willing to be a, a friend. And yet they killed them. That kind of deception stank in the nose of God as well as the people of that time. Now things, sometimes bad things happen even when good things are happening. The nurse that was Jacob's nanny, you might say, growing up, was his mom's nurse. Uh, somehow she wound up in Jacob's family, whether mom sent him there to check up on her or whether uh, maybe when she died, when, uh, when Rebecca died, uh, then Deborah came. But she was there with the family and she was a part of the members of the family. And after they'd been to Bethel, after they had gotten this blessing from God, she died. Now, it wasn't a, um, an accident or a disease. It was just she was so blessed. It's kind of like Enoch walking with God and, and God took him. It was just, you know, it's time for her to rest. She's about 150 years so years old and she just said, this is, this is wonderful. And, and she, she died. But you know, sometimes bad things and good things happen mixed. After, no, not much after they'd left Bethel and were headed to uh, Isaac's home. He had another son. His name was Benjamin, although she didn't call him that. Son of sorrow, he called him son of joy. But Rachel died in childbirth. Now the first time Isaac gets to see that grandson. And then the story skips ahead to the death of Isaac. Because it wants to not break up the story of, of Joseph and his brothers who hadn't quite learned the lesson yet when they put him in the pit and they sold him to be off as a slave in Egypt to the Midianites. Deceived their father by bringing him a bloody cloth. Is this his coat, by the way? Well, it must have been torn up by animals. And Isaac was still alive at that time. Jacob, Joseph had been in, in prison already by that time. He'd been in, in Egypt three years when uh, he died. And Jacob and Esau got together. And they buried their father. And Esau went off. He said, just like Lot and Abraham, it's just it was too much for us to both be here. He said, I'm going south. I'll head south. You take, you know, from Beersheba on up, and I'll go down below, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll split up like that. And they left on very good terms. But he always remembered his brother was a deceiver. I had one lady that uh, wanted to become a Seventh-day Adventist. She didn't want to do all the things that Seventh-day Adventists do, though. She said, I have one little sin I want to hang on to. Is that okay? Would that be okay? Would you baptize her now, you know? Knowing what's in her heart, you know, sometimes things happen, but if you're planning on it, it's a totally different thing. When Jacob blessed his sons in Egypt before he died, he did not give any land to Simeon and Levi because of their cruelty, is what he said. Just gave them some cities. Now, it worked out as a blessing with Levi, spread out all over so they could teach the word of God. Because Levi did some other things that re-ingratiated him. And he received the part of the birthright blessing that dealt with spiritual things. And Judah, the fourth son, skipped over from Reuben, because Reuben did some naughty things with um, his... Uh, family that uh, you have to read about. Uh, and it made him forfeit his birthright. And he was not going to receive a territory either, but he would uh, not be left out. And his birthright went to Judah, the fourth son, who then became the ruling body. But the joy is in the end, in Revelation chapter 7, where it mentions the tribe, on equal footing are Reuben and Simeon and Levi. 
But Judah is at the head. I want to read this uh, little part from uh, Patriarchs and Prophets. It says, Esau and Jacob had alike been instructed in the knowledge of God, and both were free to walk in his commandments and to receive his favor, but they had not chosen to do this. The two brothers, even though they were twins, they weren't twins in their spirit, walked in different ways, and their paths would continue to diverge more and more widely. There is no arbitrary choice on the part of God by which Esau was shut out from the blessings of salvation. The gifts of grace through Christ are free to all. Aren't you thankful for that? There is no election but one's own by which any may perish. Nobody's predestined to be lost. Calvin was wrong. God set his, forth his word, the conditions upon which every soul will be elected to eternal life, obedience to his commandments through faith in Christ. God has elected a character in harmony with his law, and anyone who shall reach the standards of this requirement, his requirement, will have an entrance to the kingdom of glory. Christ himself said, He that believeth on the Son of God hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not on the Son shall not see life. For not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. In Revelation, he declares, Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have a right to the tree of life, and may enter in through the gates into the city. I was kind of counting up the number of sermons I've preached over the years, and I included evangelistic meetings as a sermon each time I've preached and different lectures and things like that that I had given and uh, even included uh, you know, some other programs uh, that I had given on health and some things like that. And I, I counted up uh, about 1,700 sermons in my life so far. And I think except for some special programs, uh, and never on a, 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 a Sabbath morning, uh, except maybe a children's story or two, have I ever done anything that would be a deception for someone? But this morning, since we're talking about deception, and since I have a friend here who's, who's asked, are we going to do something, you're going to do something like that? I'm going to do something like that. I'm going to tell you ahead of time it's a deception. What you're seeing is not really what you're seeing. But it illustrates the point. The woman who said, I have one little sin I want to hang on to. She used a phrase which in that day was pretty common, some of you older folks may remember it. That's my bag. That's the thing I like to do. You can't take that away from me. I wouldn't be me if I wasn't doing that sin. I have a little piece of rope in here. And that rope represents the life of a person in sin. But if we take that person out, their life can be free from sin. And that's what we're talking about you know, it's not just wearing the armor like your own self-righteousness or your own faith. It's wearing God's armor. That's his faith. That's his salvation. That's his righteousness. But if you're not willing to accept that, you want to go to places like Dinah did with the friends, that places you shouldn't go. If you want to go to places, uh, sometimes God may be there. When I went into that bar, the thing I wanted to see was that the open mic night because it was a magic bar. There was not really much magic going on. They had one comic that was a filthy mouth person. I said, oh, what am I doing here? Uh, why did I sign up to be on the program? I'd get out of here if I wasn't already scheduled to be up. Not next, but the next one. What am I going to do? It's going to be a really strange thing because I'm going to do some lessons on God in this bar. So I'm asking God, what do I do? Let's just relax. I got it covered. The next person who got up was a singer. She sang gospel songs ending with Amazing Grace. Set the tone beautifully. And by the time I was done, um, I had converted a whole table or two in the bar, and uh, it was a bar restaurant, and I uh, sat with them and talked with them and witnessed to them. And in fact, I got invited to one of their weddings uh, later, uh, a couple of years later. You know, that's not the best choice to make. 
I was young and foolish, and God blessed it anyway. This lady, she wasn't young. She wasn't fooling anybody. Because when you put your life into sin, it gives the devil certain rights to tie all sorts of naughty problems in your life. And you will have problem after problem after naughty problem developing all throughout your life and through the generations to come because that's what it affects like Jacob his generations now Jesus the God of Bethel the God where he went and saw angels ascending and descending and we find out from the New Testament that ladder that was Jesus himself the angels were climbing he is an expert at untying all those naughty problems in our life if we let him But we have to let him. It has to be his work and not ours. Our righteousness is as filthy rags, but his righteousness cleanses and cleanses forever. In the list in Revelation 7, all the tribes are there. Except for Dan, but uh, that's a whole other story. But those who were doing things at this time, they repented. They didn't let their lives get back into sin. Because if you do let your life get back into sin, there's a, always a Savior. But there are also always consequences. Because the devil is ready, standing, ready to go, and your sins will come back, and the problems will come back as quick as one, two, three. They'll be back just like that. And your life, when that happens, will be back into sin because all those temptations are there, and you won't be able to overcome them without the power of God in your life. Now, I am thankful for these holidays because they bring family back together. And I have some family members here who, uh, when they were here, had a group, and they still sometimes use that group for witnessing purposes. I call them Kindle. And uh, my daughters, Kemily and Callie, are going to come up, and they're going to sing a song which helps to tie this idea of being able to go back no matter how dirty you are whether you know you're you're the Dinah whether you're the Reuben whether you're Jacob still struggling with it whether you're Simeon and Levi and murderously angry or whether you're the whole brothers who throw jo Joseph in the pit there's hope and this song tells you about it <laughs> 